Hi, it's Todd of Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here. And today I'm going to show you how to make a medieval archery bracer. So one that's going to be fairly similar to this decoration will be a bit different, but this kind of style of bracer. I'm going to walk through the materials that you need, the tools that you need, and the processes that you need. And basically we're going to make one on screen and show you how it's done. Now the first examples that I'm showing now are very well done from the Mary Rose. You would expect that. Most of the archers that were on that ship were the personal bodyguard of Henry VIII. They're going to have good kit. But still, you see slightly rougher ones. They're probably professionally done because they use leather as stamps, but they came from the manufacturer pretty rough as you see them. Anybody can do that if you own the stamps. Now these other two pictures I'm showing now are from knives and scabbards, and they're knife scabbards, obviously, not braces. But the point is, the decoration is very crudely done. It's just been incised and just in, enlarged to show it. Whether they were manufactured by that or it was the people who owned it did it, we'll never know. But the bottom line is in medieval and Renaissance life, if it didn't move, it was decorated. So even if you couldn't afford for a leather worker to do it, you can do it yourself. And these are the skills that I'm going to show you today because it really is straightforward to do something. Some of you will have more skill, some less, but you can do something that is convincingly medieval. So let's get down to it. Let's go make a bracer. This is the basic toolkit that we will need to make our bracer. So we have a scalpel for the cutting or a sharp knife, an awl for making holes into the leather, linen thread, wax to, linen, uh, to wax the thread, a bone creaser for marking, pushing down, decorating, a saddler's needle, pen for marking out, uh, a buckle, some paper for doing the patterns, a little bit of white PVA wood glue, a hammer, this is a wooden mallet but you can use any old hammer, straight edge ruler and a hole punch which is not essential, you can make the holes in other ways but it makes life easier and neater. Here are the paper patterns that I've made for cutting the leather. I have here three pieces of vegetable tanned leather. Now veg tanned leather is the way it was done historically in the medieval times. But it's not just me being historically a, a purist. It's a much better leather to use for this application than modern chrome tan leathers, which tend to be a little bit soft. You can't decorate them. They're just not as workable. So veg tan is what you want to do for this. This one is about 2.2 uh, millimeters thick. Um, sorry, I don't know the ounce weight for the US viewers. But it's about 2.2 millimeters, and that's really good for the strapping. Then we've got a thicker one here, which is about 3, 3.5 millimetres, so about an eighth of an inch. And this one is good for the main body of the bracer, the front facing of the bracer. Then for neatness, I really quite like to put a back onto my bracers. And so I do the, the back with a thinner leather. It is not essential by any means, and they tended not to do it. But this one is about 1.6 millimetres, so around about sixteenth of an inch. Here we have the three component pieces for our bracer. So this is where they're going to lie. So our job now is to start sewing them together. The next step is to mark on where this, where the main body of the bracer is going to overlay the straps. So I'm just going to put a mark in there, uh, about eight, 10 millimeters in. There. And I'll just make sure that mark is just underneath the edge of the leather work. But to be honest, where it's in a crease like that, when you dye it, if you dye it, it's not going to show in a way. Now here is a piece of a very dense foam. Now, this is the way I've always done my leather work, and it makes life very, very easy, because I punch through the top layer of leather and through the bottom layer of leather while it is on this foam. You can use a very cheap building lumber. So the cheaper, faster it is, that it's built, faster grown that it is, the better it is for this application because the ore will go in very easily. I'm just going to put in three holes now at each side. Now that's not going to be enough to hold everything secure. So I'm going to put three more just slightly offset because of the angle of the strap. And there we are. The next stage 
is to take some thread. Don't go crazy long with your thread, but I've got about a yard here, about a metre. That's plenty. It'll probably do well most of the holes, I'd imagine. So you've got an unwaxed linen thread and a block of beeswax. Now what you want to do is pull the thread through the beeswax so it, so it coats it. So now I've got a little bit of beeswax on my thread. And then you pinch your finger and thumb together. Pinch it hard. I haven't got a lot in the way of fingernails, but you pinch it between your, your nail and your finger like this and you just stroke it through. And um, that does two things. It, it really pushes the wax into the end of the thread. And also it allows you to thread the eye of the needle easily because the thread is actually relatively thick. Then you just pull it and you give a slight twist to the needle so it just twists up and you pull it down, you stroke it down. And what it does there is it beeswax binds up and that's one of the reasons that you have the beeswax is so that when it passes through a hole if the thread is broken and worn it tends to not unravel so now I have my meter my yard of thread on the needle and I've tied a knot in the end sorry I forgot to mention that I've just tied a knot in the end now that knot can pull through but what you do is you put it through from the back face of the top face of your bracer and now my next stitch is going through there. I'm going to pick up the strap and push that needle through. So what's happening is that that knot, which would be unsightly otherwise and would also catch, is now going to be between two layers of leather. I'm now just going back to the first hole. I'm not pulling tight at this point because you'll pull the knot through otherwise. Now then. At this point, if I carried on sewing in the same direction, I would still leave these gaps here, which we don't want. So I'm just reversing the direction now and going back the way I've come. And it's going to ultimately end up looking like it's saddle stitched. And it's, it's an easier way to get this look, this strength. And for this application, you don't need the super strong nature that you get with the saddle stitch. If you're interested in why saddle stitching is so strong, go look it up on YouTube. This is not the time and the place. So I've just done a couple more stitches. And now we can cut the thread off. Nothing is going to go anywhere. So I'll stitch up the rest. Now for the next step. I've sewn up all four of the strap positions onto the bracer and it's time to sew the buckle onto the strap here. One thing I forgot to mention is that these bracers are sized and worn over a doublet which is of course the medieval way. Very rarely would it be onto shirt sleeves or a bare arm. So if you're a lady or your arms are thin or you're not going to be wearing it over a doublet these dimensions probably need to be reduced a little bit. Another thing that I would say from personal preference is that a bracer that laces up down the sides, I find much more comfortable to wear over a shirt or skin. But the buckled ones here, which is the medieval norm, are much better for wearing over a coat because they're just easier uh, to use. So now we're going to punch the holes for the buckle. But obviously, we have the buckle pin here, so we need to cut a little slot for that. Probably a bit longer than you think it was going to be. So I'm just going to cut one now by eye. Uh, I'm going to use my hole punch bending the leather punching straight through and then you can connect those holes using your very sharp scalpel and then I will give you a dimension so if you look at that now you can see here let's see if we can get it to focus and that looks to be about 15 millimetres, 5 eighths of an inch long, that whole slot. And that will give you a good size for the buckle. So just finishing off. And then a little wiggle on the needle, I often find, just helps it to find the right hole. And again, that's why the needles are not sharp because if the needle was sharp, it would make its own hole and it would make the whole sewing very, very difficult. So, got plenty of thread in there now. And I'm just gonna cut off. And there we have.
have our bracer with everything sewn up. The next stage is to stick the back on. Partly this is a way of finishing the back very nicely. I happen to like it. The other thing is, for whatever reason, in my very long archery career, I have always slapped my wrist with the string. And I know 50 million of you are going to tell me what I'm doing wrong. But the point being is that it hurts my wrist even through sort of regular kind of leather. So I like it to be a little bit thicker. So what you do, first of all, is just dampen the leather slightly. If you just try and glue it up, what tends to happen is the, the glue just sort of doesn't soak in really. It, it just creates a little film on top. And you get a much better bond if you just wet the leather, but you do not soak the leather, just, just dampen it down. And then you'll find even with wood glue, it will be dry and ready for the next stage relatively quickly. So that's just dampened now. <clears throat> So now I'm just putting some wood glue in, PVA, regular kind of glue, nothing clever about it. You don't want loads and loads because if it squashes out the sides and it goes onto the front face, that will then interfere with the dyeing. The dye won't take very well to the PVA glue. Now the other thing about wetting the leather is it allows it to be flexible. And so you can start to press things down and you can mould it. And this is one of the reasons that I really like veg tan leather. So I'm just putting that down now. And now I take my bone. And it's a bone creaser, but a bit of polished wood, the back of a spatula, anything really. What I'm doing now is pressing the leather down around the bottom of the straps there and it creates a, a register mark, it creates a location. So what I can then do is cut the top surface knowing that it's located into these marks, so knowing that it's not going to move around on me. And then I'm just pushing it down to make sure all the glue is, is nicely in there. Being careful to try not to get it on the front face. So that's good. Now, getting rid of a bit of glue there. So I'm going to take my scalpel again. Just going to trim off the leather that I don't want. What I'm doing here is I'm repeatedly going over the surface with the bone. And it does two things. It pushes the glue in right into the leather. But the other thing it does is it the dampness of the veg tan leather allows you to mould it and shape it. This is not the case with chrome tan. That's one of the reasons that we can't use chrome tan, is this sort of behaviour would not be shown by the leather. But it means that I can absolutely make sure that the two bits of leather are in contact, because although it was bowed earlier on, now they'll just settle down and sit nice and flat. Now all we do sit for maybe half an hour and wait for it to dry off a little bit. Overnight is better if you've got the time. And then we'll come back and decorate. And there you have it. You can see how I've pressed in there on the back face where the strap mounts are. So it's had a little time to dry now. And the next stage is to stitch around the perimeter. It just makes for a stronger bracer. So what I'm going to do is set the stitching down into a little groove. So I've just got my scalpel here and I'm just, just putting my finger against it. And I kind of, where I put my finger, I can do a depth stop. And I'm just cutting a groove around the outside. I've cut a groove all the way around the perimeter now. And I'm taking the end of the bone, which is quite sharp, but the end of a knitting needle or, or really anything that you can find that, that will go into that groove and just widen it out. Now on the front here, I've cut this perimeter groove and widened it with the bone. Now when I put my stitching, I put it into that groove. So I punch through in, into the base of the groove and sew up there. 
And then what it does is it allows the stitching to be lower than the surface of the leather and it protects it, so it keeps it strong and stops it wearing away. And now it's time to decorate it. And this is where veg tan leather really comes into its own above chrome tanned. So I'm not gonna soak this wet. I'm just gonna get cloth with a bit of water on it, squeezing out, and I'm just rubbing over the surface. So first off, we're putting a border across it because the central part, you don't really want any decoration because it's gonna get rubbed away. Just gonna widen that very gentle cut. It was shallow, that cut, and it's often best done with a knife that's not super sharp, in fact, because then you cut through too deeply. So I've got a lovely wide border now. And I widened it with the bone. I'm gonna put another couple of lines in. So this type of decoration is called incising. So you're incising, you're cutting the surface, but you don't cut it very deep. Now for decorative work, this is fine, but if it's structural like saddles, then you can't do this kind of incising because it, it weakens the leather too much. It will give points where it will break. You're, you're cutting away the substance of the leather. And again, I've got those nice lines that I put in. I've gone a straight edge this time so it looks good. But you know, if you had to do it, you could just do it freehand. Just widen those up. But these I am now gonna go freehand. I'm just gonna put another border onto the edge here. I'm just using the edge of my finger almost as a, a distance guide. But it's, you know, this is a medieval artifact. Very, very rarely is there anything that you would describe as perfect. So, you know, if your work's a bit rough around the edges, it really doesn't matter. Think back. Think back to those drawings of the knife sheaths that I showed earlier on. So again, I'm just widening. Oop. Now, I don't know if you can see it. I just absolutely slipped out the groove there. So I'm just going to rub that out. And you know what? Nobody will know or care. Now the next part of the process I'm going to do is what's called stamping. So this is a little bit of incising here. And I've got myself a very small punch. I don't know if you can just see that. Ah, oh, no, you're not going to see it on there. But it's one of the ones I had earlier. And this was a bought punch, but you can make your own punches out of anything that's hard, bit of brass, bit of bone even, even the end of a bit of, a wo of wood if it's not detailed. This might shake the camera a bit, so I'm sorry if it does. No measuring, just freehand. Light punch, and it presses. Presses into the surface, can you see? So, I'm just gonna finish that, that work off now. Go back to the other side. And there you can see. And now I'm gonna put a border around the outside. I think I'll show you a homemade stamp as well. So I'm just gonna put a little border in. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's put a couple of borders in going down. Gonna freehand the other lines on here just to show that it can be done. Again, I shall widen these with the bone. So all I'm doing is pushing the end of the bone into the groove and just dragging it down. Polished bone works really well because you can get it very smooth. And then got a nice little stamp here, just a homemade one I made with a bit of iron rod and a, a hacksaw, a file and a punch. 
Now the bigger the punch, the harder you have to hit. It's a surface area thing. Annoying noise. There you can see where we're up to. And then like I said at the beginning, Medieval Mind hates anything undecorated. We'll open these up and put some punch work in them as well. I saw a wonderful uh, piece of work that I had to replicate for the Victorian Album, Albert Museum here in the UK in London. And it had this kind of crosshatch pattern on the back of it. And because of the way your arm is, it rotates as you're cutting the lines. The whole pattern was just fanned on the back. It was, there was no straight edge involved, it was all freehand. And it was an incredibly expensive high status piece. And there often is, I've done a video about it actually, there's often just no requirement for beautifully executed. It just needs to be decorated. That's the most important thing. Just to show to you that you can use all manner of things, whatever you find around you, you don't need to have proper and perfect punches. So all I've got is a, a cross head th screwdriver here. Now I'm not gonna hit this, but I'm just gonna push it in. And there you have the finished piece. Well, hopefully that was useful for you and possibly even interesting. I just implore you, go and make it. Making things is just such a lovely thing to do. People historically had plenty of creative flair. Plenty of other of them didn't, right? So don't think that you're not good enough. Just go and make something. It'll be personal to you, right? Whether it's great or not so great, there are examples of it in history. Just go and do it. Now in America, you can buy the materials from Tandy, I believe, and I'll leave that to you. Uh, in Europe it's a little bit harder, but the UK we've got traditionalmaterials.co.uk who'll sell you small amounts of material for making braces like this and the tools. If you still haven't got the courage to go and do it, but go and do it, then feel free to come back and you can buy braces from toddcutler.com and I'll put a link for all these three things in there. Thank you very much, hope you enjoyed watching.